back as far as we can in the history of life on this planet, and we find that the first concern of prehistoric man was food and shelter, and better means of providing these essentials to comfort and happiness. Through the ages has persisted this desire for a roof tree, a home for oneself and one's family. Early in his development, man was moved by some irresistible inner stirring to seek greener pastures that lay just around the next bend in the river. And so he fashioned a rude boat. He put a wheel at each end of an axle, the better to survey the country about him. And mechanical transportation began. Meanwhile, men were thinking, puzzling about the universe. In 300 BC, Euclid laid a firm base for the whole sequence of science and engineering with his books on geometry. And half a century later came Archimedes with the discovery of the laws governing the great mechanical principle of the lever, a necessary part of most machines today. The intellectual obscurity of the Dark Ages was dispelled just 500 years ago when Gutenberg invented printing. Now the spread of learning was accelerated and great minds were stimulated to great achievements. How far back must we reach to find the beginnings of scientific of engineering principles we accept so readily today. How easy to forget that Leonardo da Vinci, the artist who fixed forever on canvas the tantalizing smile of the Mona Lisa, was the first engineer of modern times, the genius who originated the science of hydraulics, a principle that operates unchanged in our motor car brakes today. With the dawn of the 17th century, Galileo invented the telescope. Then came Leeuwenhoek, whose epical contribution was the microscope. Supreme among scientists of all countries and all times is Isaac Newton. The fall of an apple, so the legend goes, led him to study that mysterious force we call gravity and to formulate the laws that govern a falling body. There were great ones in those exciting days of the 18th century. Lavoisier has been rightfully called the founder of the science of chemistry. The man who saved so many lives with his miner's lamp, Davy, also discovered how to control the electric arc with which we weld our automobile bodies. And in our own country, Benjamin Franklin performed his famous experiment with the key and the kite, opening the way for other pioneers in electrical research, men whose names we must use today when we talk of electricity, Volta, Galvani, Ampere, Faraday, Ohm, and Watt. With the turn of the 19th century, the cry was steam. On the Hudson River, Fulton launched his steamboat. On rail, Stevenson ran the first steam locomotive. The first photograph was made by Wedgwood. The vulcanization of rubber was introduced by Goodyear. The telegraph was the invention of Morse. And from the laboratory of Bell came the telephone. Farmers the world over blessed John Deere for the steel plow. Making possible this age of steel was the Bessemer process for treating molten iron. To that great benefactor of the human race, Thomas Alva Edison, we owe the electric light and the talking machine. All over America spread the spirit of scientific investigation and the problem of providing personal transportation with a self-propelled vehicle fired many an imagination. How crude were the automobiles of only a comparatively few years ago. Sometimes they ran, and then again, sometimes they didn't, for a car was a temperamental creature in those days. And unless the motorist was also something of a mechanic, he was likely to find himself at mealtime far, far from home and hungry. Just to make the contraption run was the main object of those early builders. They didn't much care how it looked. No, those early cars were nothing much to look at. And they also left much to be desired on the score of room, comfort, and easy riding. But in their crude workshops, the pioneers were working just as they have always worked through the centuries. No vast engineering laboratories were theirs. Here was the American way at work. Here was free enterprise building to a glorious triumph. For a new era in motoring was dawning. A new car was on the way, a car so revolutionary in its mechanical betterments that it was destined to be a sensation. For here was a car with fresh styling, with more power for its size than the biggest, with four-wheel hydraulic brakes for safety, 
with oil filter, air cleaner, aluminum pistons, full pressure lubrication, tubular axles, and shock absorbers for efficiency and comfort. All commonplace now, but in 1924, combined here for the first time, the first car to bear the name of Chrysler. It would not have been difficult for an engineer at that time to set down his major objectives. They were greater safety, economy and dependability, better appearance, riding comfort, an ease of handling, and more room. Engineers well knew what you, the motorist, wanted, and they had their work cut out for them. It was their job to find out how improvements could be made and still keep down the initial cost of the car. That was the beginning of a new world in motoring. The great resources of science were put to work for the benefit of the average man. Now the fruits of research were made available to everybody, for no longer was a fine automobile just a rich man's hobby. Here science was, and is, applied to practical things. And by instrumentation, goes far beyond ordinary perceptions, beyond the range of human sight and hearing, of touch and taste and smell, all for the benefit of the ultimate consumer, for you and me. The engineers know their objectives. Their problems, thousands of them, are to devise ways to attain those objectives, to find an answer to that ever-persisting question, how can we build better? Here from one organization are gathered a great body of engineers. Here in the laboratory devoted to ferrous metals, there is constant research to learn more about and thus improve the basic ingredients, which will later form bodies, frames, engine blocks, axles, and shafts for your cars and trucks. Each section is allotted to the study of one of the basic elements of steel, such as carbon, manganese, or molybdenum, so the engineers can discover for your ultimate benefit just what each will do under different circumstances. Nowadays, metallurgical research is expanded by the use of the spectroscope, which can detect in an alloy the presence of any metallic element by photographing its lines in a spectrum. Essential to the quality of certain alloys are exactly the right amounts of such elements as zinc, tin, copper, or lead. Today, no metal can keep a secret from these engineers, for they can detect in the organic structure a bit of foreign matter so small that it's the equivalent of finding the traditional needle in the haystack. Discovering the needle in 12 and a half tons of hay would be picking out one ten millionth of the stack. Still another delicate instrument, the densitometer, measures the quantity of each element present in any alloy. Laying bare the mysteries of metals gives you a better automobile, and here by the use of polarized light, the engineer sees just how a particular part behaves in action. They literally look into a model of it and observe just what happens when a load is applied. Thus they can determine where useless metal can be eliminated from different parts of your car or where a part should be strengthened for longer life. Here again the camera sees what escapes the human eye. Types of metal treatment are recorded in this X-ray diffraction four-place camera which photographs atomic changes in the metal undergone in the process of heat treating or working and reveals to the engineer important facts about the internal structure of the metal so it will be exactly fitted for the job it has to do for you. Still another wonderfully valuable instrument by which we learn even more about metals is this, in which by photomicrography, our engineers magnify the grain structure as much as 5,000 diameters. To help us picture what such a magnification means, suppose a three-inch rubber band were stretched until it was more than a quarter of a mile long. That would approximate multiplying it by 5,000. Day after day, year in and year out, these investigations go forward, always with two objects in mind. First, to create uniformity and precision, so every part of your car will be maintained at the highest standard. This strict control is further checked on a variety of ingenious machines such as this that twists a rear axle shaft, or this that places a load of more than 100,000 pounds on the metal used in a spring leaf. Parts are subjected to the equivalent of many years of normal usage to ensure dependability in the car from bumper to bumper, 
thus double-checking previous findings. The second function of these engineers is to seek new facts and new methods to make better cars and trucks. For instance, more than 750 combinations of alloys were studied over a period of years before the starting announcement of the development of Amola Steel by our engineers, and now used in many parts of the corporation's products. So amazingly tough is Amola Steel that a bolt of it can be bent over flat on itself without breaking. A rear spring leaf can be wound into a flat spiral, yet it can be made hard enough to cut glass, and such is its fine quality that Amola, the same steel that's in axles and springs, will take a beautiful edge and give you a velvety smooth shave. And although this blade is only five one thousandths of an inch thick, it is so springy and so tough that it does not break when bent to a sharp angle. Nowadays, our engineers build metal bearings that are exact to within 25 100 thousandths of an inch. This microphotographic apparatus by using the principle of reflected light rays, can measure one millionth of an inch. Another amazing instrument is the profilometer, which measures surface imperfections with an exactness never before possible. Until it was developed, we couldn't readily measure such minute roughness and so couldn't easily correct it. To the eye and to the touch, these two surfaces are alike but the profilometer shows that one of them actually has miniature hills and valleys on its surface. The other piece has a mirror-like smoothness. We have accomplished this by a new commercial process known as Super Finish, also pioneered by Chrysler Corporation. We use polishing stones rubbing in an oily lubricant under pressure to scrub metal until there are no projections on it above the base surface. That means that complete lubrication is immensely improved and amazingly perfect fits of super finished parts are obtained. To produce such smoothness, not commercially attained until super finish appeared, was naturally a triumph for engineers. But more important, it is a triumph for every motorist who drives a car built by the corporation. For super finish means lower lubrication costs and better performance. As for long life, super finished parts will almost never wear out. Power, to create it and to transmit it economically and efficiently, is so important a part of engineering research that this entire building, as well as other laboratories, are devoted to measuring power and developing better ways to create it on a variety of machines called dynamometers. On this one, rear end assemblies are linked up in pairs and then strain against each other for hours or days while the engineers note the results and thus find ways to improve. A vital part of the study of power concerns its control with brakes, as every motorist well knows. On this dynamometer, hydraulic brakes are tested and their effectiveness measured at different speeds. From the data accumulated here, brake engineers constantly seek means of improving brake bands and drums as well as the entire braking system itself. Our engineers pioneered in hydraulic brakes. From the beginning, every car built by the corporation happened. On test here is an engine, the heart of an automobile. Music to the ear of the engineer is its sweetly humming voice. The tachometer shows this engine is turning over at 4,000 revolutions per minute. The engineer may run it 100 hours or more at this speed. Now, 4,000 RPM is equivalent to 80 miles an hour car speed. So this engine in 100 hours may run the equivalent of 8,000 miles, jamming a year's operation into four days. Thus, the engineer learns and improves. Here, a massive diesel engine on test, running at 2,600 RPM. These rugged units, using inexpensive oil for fuel instead of gasoline, were developed by the corporation and are engineered into heavy-duty trucks that are hard at work the country over. Then there is the sturdy gasoline engine for trucks, which has been built into hundreds of thousands of dependable units. Units that for years have proved themselves willing and faithful helpers in doing the work of the world in war and in peace all over the earth. 
Other engineers studied the industrial engines, both diesel and gasoline, that are to be found in industry and on the farm, always on the job, wherever an unfailing source of motive power is demanded. Still another group of engineers devotes its research to the famous Chrysler Marine engine that in the water upholds the tradition of performance just as the automobiles demonstrate their superiority on land. And what's this? A one-cylinder engine, something you'd hardly expect to find here. Yet it serves for many tests. With it, the engineer experiments with fuels and lubricants and looks into the mystery of the combustion chamber. What he learns can be readily applied by simple multiplication to as many cylinders as desired. Like the power testing dynamometers on which multiple cylinder engines are tested, it measures the amount of fuel consumed, shows the speed, the temperature, and the torque created, and it also can be adjusted to increase or decrease the pull on the engine, thus duplicating actual road conditions. And from constant research carried on in dynamically balancing rotating automotive parts of the cars and trucks, you have benefited by greater economy, efficiency, operating smoothness, and longer trouble-free life for your car. Mounted here on the end of the crankshaft is a small and compact unit, one of the great engineering advances of recent years. It is Chrysler Corporation's Fluid Drive. Both the principle and the mechanism are simplicity itself. Each member looks much like half a metallic grapefruit with the pulp removed, leaving the partitions. The two halves are filled with oil and bound together. A liquid tight seal prevents loss and deterioration of the oil. When one half is revolved, what happens is much like this. If two electric fans are set up facing each other and one of them is revolved, the rotating motion will be immediately communicated to the other by means of the airstream that the first fan sends out. So when one member of the fluid drive unit revolves, the turning motion is instantly transmitted by the oil stream created to the other member. Thus the driving power of your car is transmitted through an oil cushion. Because there is no metal to metal contact, there is nothing to wear nor get out of order. When you fluid drive, you can creep along at half a mile an hour or accelerate with silken smoothness to top speed without any interruption in the steady surge of power. Stalling and jerking are forever eliminated. No wonder fluid drive has been called the latest miracle of engineering. In Chrysler Corporation laboratories, as many as 1,500 different research tests are usually proceeding at the same time. All tests to maintain standards, to create new things, or to make old ones better, so you will have a more dependable and efficient vehicle. Take carburation, for example. The men in this department are concerned with one small, although vastly important, part of an automobile. Here, both the carburetor and the air cleaner are tested. A manometer measures the air pressure. The volume of gasoline and the volume of air that pass through the carburetor are recorded to determine the most economical mixture for smooth performance of your car or truck not only at sea level, but also in high altitudes. To obtain still another scientifically accurate check on carburation, as well as on the cooling system and car performance in general, the engineers built this full-sized wind tunnel. The propeller can make a 90 mile an hour wind which simulates car movement on the road. A large dynamometer creates any needed load at the rear wheels. Thus, by instrumentation, they erect the equivalent of a mountain here in the laboratory and then study ways to make the engine operate more smoothly and economically. In this field, the engineers have made such extraordinary progress that a separate building houses their spectacular experiments looking toward greater smoothness and longer life. Few people know about the achievements in powder metallurgy, and yet its products such as these are to be found in every one of our cars and trucks as well as in scores of other machines, such as airplanes, railroad locomotives and coaches, refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, clocks, elevators. In fact, practically wherever mechanical parts need lubrication. In this new branch of metallurgy, virgin metals such as copper and tin are finely powdered. Then they are mixed together in proper proportion 
and made into forms under great pressure. Next, the shapes are baked to form a sort of hard metal sponge, which is then filled with oil. The result is this astonishing development, the oil-like bearing. In appearance, it looks much like any ordinary bronze bearing. But as a matter of fact, because of its spongy texture, it is more than one-third oil by weight, although still of tremendous strength. If pressure is applied to oilite, tiny drops of oil come to the surface. In other words, here is a bearing that oils itself. Oilite bearings are so strong that loads equal to 20 tons per square inch can be maintained. As for long life, oilite bearings on test have run for 1,300 million revolutions without appreciable wear of the shaft or the bearing. On more than 20 separate parts in our cars and trucks, these marvelous bearings oil themselves for smoothness and long life. Impartial observers representing a great engineering magazine have voted our steel body the safest in the automotive industry. Comfort must be combined with this safety, and so vibrations are viewed on the oscilloscope and then various types of insulating materials are applied to take them out. Outstanding, too, has been research in rubber, resulting in many compounds that have been put to wide use throughout our cars and trucks. For example, the bonding of rubber to metal contributed to the practical development of floating power engine mountings, patented by the corporation. The principle of floating power is as simple as its appearance was sensational. The engine is floated in rubber with one mounting placed high in front and the other low in the rear. Thus, by allowing the engine to oscillate about its own axis, the natural vibrations are absorbed and are smothered in soft cushions of rubber so they do not reach the body. Since 1931, the public has bought more than five and a half million cars and trucks provided with matchless floating power. Another productive field is that of plastics, which are now used for steering wheels, instrument panel parts, and electrical insulation. One day, these wizards of the laboratory may present us with a new material for bodies, strength of steel, but also translucent or even transparent. Fantastic? Well, so was the automobile itself just a few short years ago. And every new device, every engineering development means more work for a vast army of men and women. Take shock absorbers as an example. Since they became standard equipment, more than three and a half million additional man days of labor are required each year on this item alone. Thus, as cars are improved by engineering, more jobs are created, payrolls are increased, and more car owners reap the benefit of a high degree of safety increased comfort and greater economy. It would be a lot easier to build cars if we didn't have so much weather in this country. Within our boundaries, the temperature ranges up and down as much as 150 degrees. So your cars will be efficient no matter what the climate. Our engineers study their behavior in tropical weather with a thermometer way above 100 degrees and also in sub-zero cold. In this room are studied the effects of low temperatures on all phases of performance, lubricants, starting, carburation, and brake action. Right now, let's see. It's a mere 10 degrees below zero. If the engineers really wanted cold, they can send the mercury down to 60 below here in the super cold cabinet. And to find out what will happen to metal parts and to lacquer finishes in salt air, the engineers expose them to salt spray. And if defects appear, they are corrected. Up here on the sixth floor, there is great secrecy, for the models are jealously guarded from prying eyes, so when the time comes for announcing the new cars, the public, year after year, will thrill to their fresh lines. These men specialize in luxury. From their drawing boards come handsome interiors, as inviting as a fine piece of furniture. Steering wheels that make your fingers itch to grasp them. Instrument panels that are marvels of balance and visibility. Hardware that sparkles like the masterpiece of a jeweler. These artists are looking into the future, forecasting startling things to come. 
At first glance, it seems these men deal principally in mad whimsies. But behind every design, no matter how bizarre it appears, must be sound knowledge of engineering and production practice. Beauty, yes, but with it must be combined utility. Sometimes the artist's conception is realized in a full-size clay model. At other times, only the front end is built up by these deft sculptors. Or a miniature model is built out of wood. Over the framework is placed a coating of clay that is worked into an exact model of the designer's sketch. Always the engineers insist that not only must it look good, but also it must work. So they say, ah, yes, it's a striking design, but what about visibility? A pair of lights corresponding to the driver's eyes shine on the chart and show at once if there is a safe view of the road. The model must also be approved by the experts on aerodynamics, a science within itself. They work with another wind tunnel, but this one is in miniature. Suspended in the mouth of the tunnel, the model may be placed in any position. Air currents are created by a propeller and are so controlled that the engineer can turn on a gentle breeze or a hundred mile an hour hurricane. The readings on the indicators show the resistance to the wind set up by the model and permit the engineers to decide scientifically whether it is soundly designed. Always hungry for facts, the engineers delight in punishing their handiwork, for by tests such as these, they can design and engineer better automobiles. No matter how handsome a car interior may be, unless the seat cushion stands up under 1,100 bouncings an hour, it is rejected. Fabrics must pass severe trials for twisting and pulling. They must not wear through in the rubbing test. They must not fade when exposed to blistering sunshine. A car door is slammed 780 times an hour by this clever device that concentrates years of normal usage into a day. So the engineers build and then tear down that they may build better. Every test, every operation, every research project is directed to giving the owner more trouble-free performance and more transportation miles for his automobile dollar. All this is done at our expense to save you expense, to ensure happy and carefree operation of every product of the corporation. At last we come to a complete self-contained automobile, but we meet it at an unfortunate hour for it is being strapped and chained to what engineers call the Belgian Rolls. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Oscar. It is his unhappy lot to be forever bounced about while on his lap he holds instruments that record the vibrations of the body. The switch is thrown. Away she goes. No car on a cobbled road in Flanders ever took the beating to which this automobile is subjected. The wheels rest on drums with cleats placed so the car is racked unmercifully. Furthermore, the speed increases from 5 to 25 miles an hour and then goes back to 5. And yet notice that although the wheels are pounded furiously, so efficient are the springs and shock absorbers that the body rides on an even keel. In this and other tests we have seen, the engineers pre-prove the car in the laboratory by instrumentation, but they don't stop there. Long before they are made available to the public, the cars are double checked on the road. The engineers send them out over the country so they may observe their behavior under the actual road and climate conditions that the owners will encounter from coast to coast. On the solid foundations of the past, our engineers are building for the future. Here in this country, of unhampered initiative, of free enterprise, of that indomitable will to achieve that we all proudly acclaim as part of the American tradition. On every highway the country over, we see visible, tangible proof of the years of progress made by our engineers, the fruits of their labors, such outstanding motor car achievements as four-wheel hydraulic brakes, steel bodies, high compression engines, floating power, modern styling, Amola steel, super finish, and now that marvelous new development, fluid drive. All these constitute a never-ending parade of brilliant accomplishment 
contributing to your safety and happiness. They are both factual evidence and added assurance that you get the good things first from Chrysler Corporation. Thank <laughs> you.